Hi, it's Luke here, and in this video I'm going to teach you, in a nutshell, how to read a PA chest radiograph. Reading a chest x-ray is a vital skill for medical students and doctors, and often comes up in exams. While there are other chest film views, PA is the most useful, and by far the most common view you'll encounter, so this is what I'll be teaching in this short video. As this video is teaching the skill of reading a chest x-ray, I will not cover the more advanced skill of how to diagnose particular chest pathologies. By the end of this video, I hope that you will 1. Have a working background knowledge of the theory behind chest films. 2. Be able to use a systematic approach when reading a PA chest film. 3. Be able to recognise and comment on any major abnormalities. And 4. Be able to present your findings to a colleague in a coherent manner. Something I know many students struggle with, and actually I often struggle with myself. Now using my outstanding artistic talents, a bit of MS Paint magic, I'm going to briefly demonstrate how a PA film is taken. Now this is the X-ray beam emitter, which fires a cone-shaped beam of radiation towards the patient. And this is the cassette, where the X-rays are absorbed, some magic happens and a picture is made. Honestly, I don't know exactly how it works. The most important property of the beam of radiation passing through the patient is that it passes more easily through light things with a low density, like air and passes less easily through dense heavy things like bone and fluid. Because the image is negative, the bits of the film with less X-ray exposure show up lighter. This is why bone appears white. The other important thing to consider is that a chest X-ray is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object. PA, or postero anterior, means back to front, but we say it in Latin to make us sound smarter. That's the direction that the X-ray beam travels in. Because the X-ray beam is divergent and cone-shaped, objects at the back of the chest will appear larger and more translucent than objects at the front. Because of the direction of beam travel, dense objects at the back may hide objects that are more anterior. Next we're going to work through the anatomy that can be seen on a normal chest film. As you can see, there's a letter L in the top corner telling you which side is left. First of all, let's look at the airways. You can see the borders of the trachea as it runs down the centre. Next, we will look at the bones. The bone I have outlined here is the left first rib, running from posterior at the top to anterior at the bottom. The first rib isn't always visible on a chest film, but if it is, you can use it to count all the way down. On a PA film, the beam hits the posterior ribs first, so these are the ones most visible. Here you can clearly see down to the anterior eighth rib. The next bit outlined is the right clavicle. The borders of the diaphragm are outlined here. Notice that the right hemidiaphragm is higher than the left. This is normal and is due to the liver lying underneath. On the left side, you might see a bubble under the diaphragm. This is a gastric bubble in the stomach and is a normal finding. Next, we will look at the borders of the heart and major blood vessels. Let's do this clockwise from top to bottom. First you have the subclavian artery, then the aortic arch, the pulmonary artery, a small bit of the left atrium, the left ventricle, the right atrium, the superior vena cava, and the ascending aorta. Now on to the lung fields, and we'll start with the lobes. I've outlined roughly where each lobe is located on the film. First the right upper lobe, then the right middle lobe, which touches the right heart border, and the right lower lobe, which touches the right hemidiaphragm. Hopefully you notice that there is some overlap between lobes particularly between the lower lobe and the other two. This is because of the three-dimensional structure of lungs. The lower lobe occupies a space posterior to the other two lobes, and also to the dome of the diaphragm. It doesn't touch the right heart border like the middle lobe does, because the heart is anterior in the chest. The left is a bit easier, with only two lobes. The upper lobe now looks like it takes up almost the whole lung field and touches the left heart border. The left lower lobe is similar to the right and shares a border with the left hemidiaphragm. Finally, let's look at the lung hyla, the mess of squiggly stuff above and behind the heart. The hyla consists of pulmonary blood vessels, the main bronchi, and lymph nodes, although you should not be able to see lymph nodes in a normal patient. There is an indentation in the hilum on each side called the hyla point, and normally it's higher on the left than the right. Now before we jump into how to analyse a chest x-ray, I'm going to talk you through how I would present a normal one to a colleague. 
This is an ideal scenario where we assume that we have the patient's information and we know what kind of a radiograph it is. This is an upright PHS film of Mr. Duffy taken on the 1st of January this year. Exposure is adequate, the patient is not rotated and there is no motion blurring. Airway is central and patent. There are no fractures, lesions or defects visible in the bones. Cardiac silhouette is not enlarged. Both hemidiaphragms appear normal and with no blunting of the costophrenic angles. The edges of the heart and major vessels are clearly visible. Left and right lung fields are clear throughout. A gastric bubble is visible and there is normal hyla shadowing. In summary, this is a normal upright PA chest film. Any systematic approach to reading a chest x-ray always starts the same way, making sure you have the correct one. So the first step to reading any chest x-ray is 1. Check the patient's name and the date the image was taken. It seems obvious, but make sure you have the right x-ray for the right person. Some patients share the same name, so it's also good practice to check the patient's date of birth or hospital number. Many mistakes are made because people overlook trivial details such as these. 2. Check the type of film. Often you will be told the type of film, but if not, there are clues you can look for. First, you want to know from which direction the x-ray was taken, PA, AP, or lateral. While a lateral film is easy to spot, differentiating between an AP and a PA requires a bit of Sherlock Holmes clue hunting. Look at the clavicles and scapular edges on this PA film. Now let's look at the AP. Do you see any differences? Notice how the AP projection, the borders of the scapulae are sharp and appear to lie over everything else, while the clavicles appear to be obscured by the ribs and other structures. Also notice that the heart appears abnormally wide. Secondly, you want to know the position of the patient. Are they upright or lying? Again, hopefully, this information is available. If not, in an upright patient, you might see a fluid level in the stomach. 3. Check if the film is technically adequate. A useful mnemonic to remember the three aspects of technical quality is R-I-P. Rotation, inspiration, penetration. To check rotation, look at the clavicular heads and spinous processes. If the spinous processes are halfway between the clavicular heads, the patient is normally rotated. Next, check for adequate inspiration by looking at the midclavicular line and seeing which anterior rib intersects the diaphragm at this point. It should normally be the 5th, 6th or 7th. More ribs means the lungs are hyperinflated, often seen in COPD. Less means that the patient may not have taken in a full breath when the x-ray was taken. Finally, Check the penetration of the rays. Simply put, an over-penetrated film is too dark, an under-penetrated one is too white. A trick to judge penetration is to look in the region of the heart. If you can see the spaces between the vertebrae and pulmonary vessels through the heart, penetration is adequate. This diagram shows how the x-rays travel through these structures, with the heart on the left, a pulmonary vessel in the middle, and the spine on the right. In an under-penetrated film, the weak x-rays fail to penetrate even the soft tissue of the heart, meaning the heart appears just as white as bone. In an over-penetrated film, the powerful x-rays go straight through the small, soft pulmonary vessels as if they weren't even there, making them invisible, while the heart appears darker than it should. 4. Look at the big picture. When you're examining a patient, you observe the whole patient from the end of the bed before delving into small details, and it's the same with examining a piece of imaging. Look at the whole thing. Can you immediately see any obvious abnormalities, like a large lung mass? 5. Now we want to start looking at the details. There are many different systems that people use to do this, and you may find your own that works for you. But the most commonly used system is the alphabetic approach, as it's easy to remember and this way you're unlikely to miss anything. As long as you remember the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. Now let's start with A, which stands for airway. A normal airway is central and open. An airway that deviates to one side may be due to a tension pneumothorax. B stands for bones. With bones, start at the top and work your way down, making sure that you look at all the bones visible on the film. The outlines of each bone should have a smooth contour, and a break in the contour could be a subtle indication of a fracture. Also look for any lesions where the bone is more or less dense than it should be, such as the punched-out lesions often seen in multiple myeloma. Whilst looking at the bones, you should also look at the external soft tissue for any abnormalities. C is the cardiac silhouette. 
on a PA film, the heart should be less than half of the chest width. An enlarged cardiac silhouette is most commonly caused by cardiomegaly. Pericardial effusion is another important cause. D is the diaphragm. A normal diaphragm has a sharply visible border, curves downwards at the edges and the costophrenic angles. These bits should be clearly visible, as should the cardiophrenic angles. A poorly defined hemidiaphragm might be due to a lower lobe consolidation, whilst a blunted costophrenic angle is likely due to a pleural effusion. E is the edge of the heart. Here you're looking for something called the silhouette sign. Are the heart borders clearly defined? If not, this indicates that there is lung consolidation present. Remember the normal anatomy? The right heart border touches the right middle lobe, while the left heart border touches the left upper lobe. These borders may be less well defined if there is consolidation in these lobes, such as in this example of right middle lobe consolidation. F is the fields of the lung. Normal lung fields are roughly symmetrical and have these faintly fuzzy lung markings throughout representing normal vascular and lung soft tissue. One thing to note is that when describing the lung fields, there is no correct terminology, as long as what you say effectively communicates what you're trying to describe. For example, you could describe what you see here as patchy shadowing, widespread areas of increased density, multifocal opacification, or you might even get away with a load of white fuzz that probably shouldn't be here. Look carefully from the top at the apices, to the bottom, where the lung extends just below where you can see the diaphragm. Compare left to right. Firstly, see if there are any areas where normal lung markings are absent, as this may indicate collapse or pneumothorax. Can you see where the lung markings are absent in this one? This patient has a left-sided pneumothorax. I've outlined the area where the lung markings are absent. Also notice that the left hemidiaphragm is flattened compared to the right. Also look at the lung fields for any areas of abnormal shadowing, such as in this patient with tuberculosis, any opaque masses, such as in this patient with lung cancer, and for any fluid levels, such as in this patient with pleural effusion. Remember that you only see fluid levels in patients who are upright. G is the gastric bubble. A normal gastric bubble is a small dark area under the diaphragm with a fluid level. If the patient has a hiatus hernia, you may see the gastric bubble above the diaphragm. H is the hyla. Normally only the pulmonary blood vessels are visible around the hyla, so visible lymph nodes are an abnormal finding. Look around here also for masses and calcified areas. This x-ray shows a patient with hyla lymphadenopathy secondary to tuberculosis. Lastly, I stands for instruments. Instruments refers to all those things doctors like to put onto or into patients. So we're talking pads, wires, cables, tubes, etc, etc. Sometimes it's obvious what you're looking at, sometimes it's not. So if you don't know what it is, don't worry about it and don't spend too much time trying to figure it out. Now that you've been through the whole x-ray thoroughly and systematically, it's a good idea to go back through your findings and summarize them in the same order. Remember your steps. 1. Patient's name and the date of the film. 2. The type of film. The patient's position, upright or lying down, and the direction in which the x-ray beam is traveling. 3. The technical quality. Remember RIP, rotation, inspiration, penetration. 4. Look at the big picture and take note of any obvious abnormalities. And five, a systematic analysis using the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I approach. A. Check the airway is central and patent. B. Check the bones for fractures or lesions, and also check the small tissues around. C. Check that the uh, cardiac silhouette is not abnormally enlarged. D. Check the diaphragms are visible, dome-shaped, and that the angles are intact. E. Check that the edges of the heart are clear. F. Check the lung fields for normal lung markings and abnormal shadowing. H. Check the hyla for lymph nodes or masses. And I. Look for instruments. Now we've reached the fun part of the video. Using the method I've taught you, it's your turn to try a couple of practice examples. Pause the video at each image and write down your findings. And if you're feeling clever, you can make an attempt at diagnosis. Pause the video now. 
The first thing you probably noticed is that there's an abnormality on the right hand side. So let's move on to the details to figure out what's going on. The airway is deviated towards the side of the abnormality. The edge of the right hemidiaphragm is completely obscured. The right heart border is further from the midline than you would expect. The lung fields are asymmetrical, with the right being smaller than the left. And there is an area of high opacity in the inferior right lung with absent lung markings. Putting all this information together, the silhouette sign at the right hemidiaphragm suggests a lo right lower lobe problem. The asymmetry of the lungs and right-sided deviation of the trachea and mediastinal structures suggests a reduction in right lung volume. Add to this the area of opacification with absent lung markings, and you have a classic picture of a right lower lobe collapse. Now on to the next example. Pause the video now. First thing to comment on here is the technical quality. The patient may be rotated slightly, although it's difficult to tell, and it's hard to see the intervertebral spaces through the heart, suggesting underpenetration. The most striking thing to note is that the lungs are overinflated, with the eighth anterior rib intersecting the diaphragm at the midclavicular line. Going through our system shows that there are flattened hemidiaphragms on both sides with blunted costophrenic angles. And you can also see some small areas of increased opacity in the hyla. The hyperinflated lungs and flattened diaphragm are characteristic of COPD. The blunted costophrenic angles are a little bit of a red herring. They're actually the result of the flattened diaphragm. The areas of opacity in the hyla are likely due to calcification of pulmonary blood vessels, so I would strongly suspect that this patient was a heavy smoker. Smoking is bad for you, of course, and this is what happens, so the lesson is don't smoke. Now that we've reached the end, it's time to summarise what you've learnt. A little bit of background anatomy goes a long way in interpreting chest x-rays. Start with the trivial stuff before diving into trying to diagnose the patient. Remember to comment on the technical quality using R, I, P. Use the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I approach. And remember that smoking is bad for you. I would like to acknowledge www.radiopedia.org as the source of all of my x-ray images. It's an awesome website full of free educational images. Go visit it, it's good. For anyone who wants to learn more about chest x-rays and wants to look more into how to diagnose things, I would highly recommend the tutorials on www.radiologymasterclass.co.uk. Thank you for watching my video. I hope you learned plenty from it. Please leave a comment or suggestion in the comment section below.